The strongest force for conversion, the biggest effect on whether or not someone converts is the concept of social proof. And so when you have social proof, either because you've seen that people have liked or commented or shared something from a company, or whether you've just seen the company around and that's a little bit of familiarity, I think that's going to lead to much higher conversion. Hello and welcome to the Jumpstart Podcast with Jeff Olytics. I'm your host, Jeff Sauer. Today, for our 44th episode, we're going to talk with AJ Wilcox, the world's foremost expert in LinkedIn ads and the owner of B2Linked. AJ and I, we met in London a few years ago at the Hero Conference, and it all came down to sitting down for lunch with several other PPC marketers, some brilliant minds, and I think everybody was gathered around trying to ask Larry Kim questions, and AJ and I were like, well, so what do you do? And we had a nice, interesting conversation. Turns out he's from Salt Lake, and we both were on the boards of associations in our local community talking about search, and so he's on the board of SLC SEM, and I was a founder of MN Search. Anyway, so we hit it off, and he said, hey, you should get in touch with our group SLC SEM and have you come out for a speech. And so I said, okay, let's do that. (laughs) And so we met up again in SLC last summer and he was nice enough to pick me up from the airport. He even drove me to the venue for the, for the speech. What a great guy. And I've really enjoyed getting to know AJ over the past few years. And I know you're going to enjoy this conversation as well. Now, I was hoping to meet up with AJ again this week in Bologna for the AdWorld Experience Conference, but it turns out that he had another commitment already booked and he couldn't make it there. So we set up our interview while I was back in the States, and I'm actually recording this intro in a VRBO place in Venice just a few minutes before we catch our train to Bologna for the conference. Now, I learned quite a bit in this episode. We talked about LinkedIn ads a lot, how to attack a niche that you find interesting, and I even got to hear how AJ found this niche in the first place. His path is both super unique and highly interesting when you think about his field of focus in LinkedIn ads. And it was particularly fun to learn how he moved from being an ad dabbler to an expert in LinkedIn ads. Now, if you're interested in LinkedIn ads or you just want to hear a great story about entrepreneurship, then you don't want to miss my chat with AJ Wilcox. Visit jeffletics.com slash AJ for show notes. Okay, so we're here today with AJ Wilcox. AJ, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Hey, Jeff, I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, you and I have, have sort of like feel like old friends. You know, we've met a few times in person, but it feels like we've been old friends for a long time. And so I'm looking forward to getting to hear your story. Absolutely. Great. So, and, and we'll get into how you and I met along the way because I think it's sort of relevant to what you're doing in, in your industry. But I always like to start off with the question of what project, what did you work on that got you excited for this world of internet marketing? You know, for me, it started actually when I was quite young. Uh, My dad was a big Trekkie. And so we would watch Star Trek together on Saturdays. And I remember what the commercials would come and he'd start quizzing me with things like, hey, who do you think this commercial is intended for? Well, who's the audience? And it got me really interested in marketing and specifically advertising. And then when I was in college, I was working at a tech job where I was making more money than anyone else on campus. And I was like, oh, this is awesome, but I'm studying marketing. How in the world am I ever going to get a job after I graduate? Or how do I even find an internship? And then into one of my marketing classes, I you know, stepped a, a guest lecturer from a local search engine optimization agency, and he started talking about the blend between technical and marketing. And the light bulb went off for me. It was like, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I went up after class, and I just begged him for an internship, and that began all of it. That's so awesome, man. I, it's funny thinking with your technical skills, hey, is there a job for me? Can I even get a job with these skills? Very few people with that have actually even had to think about that because it's so in demand. But but I understand where you need somebody to connect the dots or you need the dots to be connected to really realize that it's possible. Oh, yeah. And, and back then, I mean, you're right. Technical wasn't a, a track. I mean, you either went full... Uh, full development engineering, uh, or you went marketing, and, and there wasn't this this area in between. So I'm really glad I found like the perfect blend. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I'd assume that at a university, they don't really they don't know that that track is possible because I think it has been around for a little bit, but but it hasn't made it into the actual curriculum of universities to say you can be technically gifted and then use that to your advantage in internet marketing. 
No, and in fact, even worse, I actually signed up for a digital marketing class my last semester, and it ended up getting canceled due to lack of interest. So really? here I am, like I had had an entire like year long internship. I knew digital marketing. I, I probably didn't need the class. I probably knew more than the teacher, um, but I, I was still really excited to be in the class and, and learn. And it got shut down because only six people signed up. <laughs> Not enough interest in internet marketing. That's that's funny. That's like the counterpoint because I, I hear a lot of people saying, and, and I teach at the university. I teach digital marketing, and I hear a lot of people tell me that there's not enough curriculum out there for people who are interested in digital marketing. So it's funny to hear it on the other side that when they do offer a class, it doesn't always necessarily mean that it's going to get interest. Yeah, and I think that's changed quite a bit, thank goodness. Um, I now see there are local universities here who offer a digital marketing degree, and. I've hired, I've uh, interviewed some of these folks, and, and they're coming out with like a great base level of understanding. So I, I'm all for that. Great. That's awesome. So you, you said that you went and talked to somebody or you, you heard that you can get, a, get it going with the technical side and everything. So how did that come to fruition in, in the actual workplace? What did you end up doing after you graduated? Yeah, so I went to go work um, for this agency who originally kind of introduced the concept of SEO, and I did SEO and I did AdWords and a little bit of analytics, a little bit of website building. And at that point, I went, oh my gosh, I love SEO. This is awesome. And man, this AdWords stuff is boring. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was my beginning. And so I, I then... Um, this was right at the height of the recession in 2008. And so mm -hmm. I graduated with a year of digital marketing experience, went out in the field going, okay, who's going to hire me? We had a, a child on the way, our first, and, uh, and and no one hired me. It took about three months to finally get a job for like $11 an hour doing keyword research uh, really? for another local agency. But I got in, and funny enough, within – this is just a giant blessing um, – within about three months – I saw a, a position open that was actually team lead over the SEO team. And this is a pretty big agency here locally. And I interviewed for it and actually got it. I mean, this is like four steps up in the organization. And that wow. propelled me forward, thank goodness. That's crazy. So you, you're, so the timeline is, is insane, really, when you think about it. There's no, nobody wants to hire you because of, because of what happened in the, in the crash and the, in the stock market and everything. And then you get in and you're basically doing what somebody would be doing would it be doing today on Fiverr. So sort of low level <laughs> type work perhaps or something that maybe it's it, yeah it's not it's not your end all be all that you're going to be there and then suddenly you apply to the ultimate job and skip four levels that's how does that even happen well what happened for me is because i obviously had a, a real love for seo at the time and uh, I, I was working side clients um not every organization that you do work for will appreciate the fact that you're you're doing a side hustle that you're yeah, burning yeah. Up in night oil uh but I, I will always recommend that everyone should be doing it and the reason why is because my colleagues would go to work at 8 a.m and they'd leave at 5 p.m and they had the chance to learn that much and i was home figuring stuff out you know, the, the same time and then going from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. And I learned twice or three times as fast as them. So, you know, when I got that position, this is people who had two, three times as much experience in SEO, but I still outperformed them. And, you know, I proved my to my future then boss that I had more hustle than they did. I wasn't just mm -hmm. around for a paycheck. Like, this is a real passion. Yeah, that's, that is cool to see you can leapfrog on top of, of what everybody else is doing. And I would agree with you know anybody who's listening to this wondering how you get ahead. I think that the side hustle or just the, the experiences that's not within the job because you can only learn so much on the job because of risk, right? When you think about the risk that goes into performing things for, for clients and you're getting paid for it, the only risks you're going to take are things that have been, or not even, you don't even want to take any risks. You only do the things that have been proven, right? Versus when you do it on your own, it doesn't matter. You're not, you know, you don't have anything, you don't have anything to lose when you do it. So you can try things, new ways, you can experiment, you can do so much more when you're doing it on your own. And so I agree that ex like a little, like building your own website might accelerate your experience five times faster than, than doing the same thing at a regular nine to five job. I totally agree. And and I think on top of that, just like what you said about learning different risk and doing things the company way, in my SEO jobs, no one ever asked me to build a website from scratch, learn HTML, learn CSS. But what happened is I did that in my side hustle, and then I became the definitive voice at this agency around how to place tracking codes and uh, and how to build sites and, and you know how to find the robot's text and, and all those types of things that just 
put me a level ahead of them, even though to me it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, for sure. And so it's, I'm guessing that some of your technical chops helped you out there, right? Just to to not be afraid of it. Because I do come across a lot of people who want to know how to do that stuff, but they either the thought of looking at a tracking code or the thought of putting in a robots.txt file, they, they're afraid, right? They're afraid that they're going to break everything. And I think that a lot of the people who are the most successful in this area have broken everything. They have actually, you know, those fears come true that you will break everything. They just end up doing it on a site that has low risk again, and then they figure out how to clean it up or how to fix it. And that's that's the skill, right? It's It's not so much how to not, it's not playing not to lose, it's playing to win, right? Or playing to to have better results, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. And I can't count on the number of fingers and toes I have, the number of sites I've crashed. But luckily, you know, two thirds of the sites or probably most I crashed from the PHP server on my local machine where (laughs) nothing was counting on it. You know, these were, these were experiments. I learned from the school of hard knocks with zero risk. So install lamp on your machine and run a WordPress site and dink around with it. It's awesome. Yeah, no, it's amazing really. And, And it's funny, like, Kim Kardashian takes all the credit for breaking the internet, but I think that a lot of us, a lot of us internet marketers have, have broken our own internet many, many <laughs> times. And, and yeah, I, I know I've spent so many late nights trying to figure out what went wrong or try to fix something. And, and that's really when you get the skills, because if you just play it safe, you never learn that. You don't get that deep knowledge. And so that, again, anybody who comes to me and says, I don't have any experience, how do I get a job? The first thing I say is, Try doing it on your own. Create your own blog. Use, you know, go to WordPress.com or install, you know, self-host on a Bluehost blog or something like that, and just see what happens. Because you have to learn so much. You have to learn to be resourceful in doing that, and it translates to almost everything else you do. That knowledge, if you have that knowledge, it doesn't harm you to know how to do things. It all, it can only help in the future. Yeah, and I think in in the current format that our education sits in, we feel like we just show up. You show up and you do what you're told. And what I wish I would have figured out earlier that I I did eventually figure out is that when you are, let's say, graduating from from college, um, you don't just do the job application and then go show up and, and start the career that you saw your parents do. There are no boundaries. You can do whatever you want. And that means skipping ahead several rungs in your career by side hustling and figure something out. Uh, you don't have to wait around for some teacher to to just give you something to, to digest. You can go out and, and just capture it. So that's what I want to pass on to anyone here who's listening who's young. Don't believe the um, – the thing that we have right now that that's you just sit there and be fed go yep. out and be hungry and do it while you're young because now i'm 32 and i, I don't have the desire to burn the, the midnight oil anymore and learn <laughs> things yeah for sure i mean that that's i agree it's a young person's game to be able to do that or, or it's like the young the excitement of doing something new and i would say that i mean the, the I, i've thought about this a lot having gone back and now teaching at a, at a school or at a university about the difference between the in-classroom learning and then the hands-on learning. I think you need both. You know, you if you the classroom can tell you the fundamentals or how to do it the right way, and then if you apply that, or if you go and do some on-the-job stuff, you can apply as much as you want to, and then they they really go hand in hand. But you can't just you can't be an expert without the experience in doing something. So you need theory and experience. I agree. The people who have the theory but no experience are pretenders, and the people who have the experience and and. Uh, and not the strategy. They're the poor people. So <laughs> definitely combine the two and get the best of both worlds. Don't be pretending. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, never stop learning. It's not. I mean, it's not too. There's no. You, you don't need to stop learning once you get out of the classroom. I, I I just did a podcast about this our last episode talking about how I'm still continuing to learn because things change and you just you just need to keep on recognizing the opportunities that come from it. Yeah, and in fact, from a recent episode of yours, uh, I was listening to, to Jeff Allen say the story about Brad Geddes and how he sees every hero conf, every session, he's taking furious notes, and that is hilarious to me. Like I, I look at Brad Geddes and go, "Wow, he is—he's the pinnacle. He probably doesn't learn anything." And then to hear that he's taking furious notes, ooh, yes, we can all learn a lesson here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, in in just even talking to Brad in general, I need to get him on the podcast, by the way. But uh, every time I talk to him, I learn. He gives me an advice or tells me something, and you can tell that he's listening to what I have to say too. You're right. He he definitely is always constantly retraining his brain and, and questioning his assumptions as much as he can. And and I think that's that's the key to a lot of people because 
you can't be a one trick pony. Whatever worked at one point wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be there. Actually, I don't want like this is going to this is going to turn into a Brad Geddes podcast episode if I'm not careful. But I remember <laughs> him t- I remember the first time I met him, he was talking about analysis and how like how that the genesis of that and it was really sort of fascinating how how it came on his lap without really you know doing much and how how that partnership happened and then it became like one of his main main areas of going and so he basically you know when you're in this industry long enough you can see people going from an idea all the way to like a startup and and doing things well it's really fascinating oh yeah opportunity comes knocking especially when you're working hard yeah and you got to put yourself out there too so let's let's get into that. Like so, speaking of putting yourself out there on your career journey, how does how does this progress? So you get the you're now punching four levels above your weight class, if you will. Probably not, but you're getting a, a new responsibility. What do you do with that, and how do you move forward? Yeah, I expanded that oppor- that opportunity that I was given. So I was leading an SEO team, and I expanded that into, hey, I really love training, and so I took on a training role for the entire company for SEO at that point. And uh, and took on like the corporate SEO and the corporate blogging and just kept bringing on more and more responsibilities. And then, uh, you know, after I had so here's how I determine how to leave a job. Uh, When I come in every single day and no longer feel like I'm learning something when I've plateaued, Mm -hmm. that's when I know it doesn't matter how much I love my coworkers or the company. That's when it's time to jet. And yep. That happened. I went and worked at uh, a couple in-house gigs. Um, I'm a huge fan of working in-house gigs after agency because in agency, you just have this this awesome mind share of everyone trying to figure out the same stuff around you. And it's so fast to learn. But then once you've gotten to that point, as long as you're still hungry and can still continue to learn on your own, you go in-house and you're going to make more money. You're going to be able to dive way deeper on projects and not just cover three inches deep and five miles wide. Um, so that's kind of what I did. Worked a couple in-house gigs and then actually got an offer from a local technology company here that that the job was really the envy of all of my colleagues. Um, I mean, I, I talked to a lot of people who said, oh, yeah, I interviewed for that, really wanted it. And that was exciting. And I went in to talk to the CMO on the first day and laid out my plan. Here's what I'm going to do with with search. Here's what I'm going to do with uh, with social. Here's what I'm going to do with uh, with website and all these things. And she said, okay, all that sounds great. But just so you know, we have a pilot starting with LinkedIn ads. See what you can mm. do with it. Mm. And uh, I had been doing digital marketing for about five years. I fancied myself a little bit of a veteran. Uh, yes. Obviously a young industry and I was a little bit cocky. And I started, like, I I told her absolutely, yes, ma'am, salute, and turn around. And I started laughing because I had never even heard of LinkedIn ads. I didn't even know that the product existed. (laughs) Uh, Done plenty with with MSN Ad Center and and, uh, soon to be Bing ads at that point. Um, Done a lot with AdWords but uh, and a little bit of Facebook at that point, but never, ever heard of LinkedIn. And so really to, like, keep the egg off my face, I went and jumped into that platform and started trying to figure things out. And within two weeks of starting, one of the sales guys came up to me and said, AJ, we don't know what you're doing, but we absolutely love your leads. Whatever you're doing, (laughs) keep it up. Nice. And so I, with a little bit of my technical background, I go log into Salesforce. I look at the leads that this salesperson's dispositioning, and all of them were sourced from LinkedIn ads. Wow. And that was my first inkling. Yeah. Something, something could be working here and I got to figure it out. Yeah. No, I'm, 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 I really want to get into the LinkedIn ads, but I got to, I actually got to ask about. This this so you you go in through you and you learn SEO as much as you can, you you decide to go in house. I, I love what you're saying about the difference between agency and in house. Actually, this is a if anybody's listening really closely, I, I have a quiz that I developed at agency or in house dot com, and it's basically to answer a few questions, sort of like how how you talked about it. Like, do you want to have do you want to get paid more or do you want the experience? Do you want to date a bunch of different websites, meaning agency, or do you want to go into work and, and punch the clock or whatever? So, um, And then the result tells you whether you should be doing an agency job or an in-house job for your next one. Um, so, and, and But that's exactly what I think you should alternate between them as much as you can because on the agency side, you get so focused on telling other people what to do that you don't always know, you don't always have accountability in the results, sort of like a talking head almost right. with the agency piece. And then in-house, it's like, wow, all the accountability falls on me and getting things done and and seeing things to, through to completion. So you can get a lot of satisfaction in when you do it. And and it does pay more. There's a lot of different benefits to doing both sides. So it's I, I like what you're saying about after you finish an agency job, you should go in-house just to see the other side. 
Oh yeah, and not that you can't switch back. Uh, I personally, this is kind of kind of ironic, but I personally said, okay, cool. Uh, I like in house so much. I'm never going to go back to agency. And then I started one. So <laughs> giggles on me. <laughs> yeah, I got I got to get into that story in just a second. But the, the one thing that I that sort of we we went over, but you were doing an SEO role, and then you said you had dabbled in AdWords, dabbled in Bing. But I know you at first you said you didn't really like AdWords. Was there a transition? that got you from liking SEO to liking AdWords or was it still like a tolerating thing? It, did you tolerate it at this point when you, when right before you jumped into LinkedIn ads? Oh, it was definitely a tolerance issue. Like I just, I felt like the process that you go through with AdWords of, okay, you wrote the ads, now see what performs, now go do the search query report, now go remove placements on display. I mean, it's just this process that just got so monotonous to me for some reason, but the same the same process that I go through on social ads is completely different. I just fell in love with social. Hmm. So I, I, I'm still of the mind that like, hey, if someone gives me an AdWords account, sorry, like you're going to get better service somewhere else. Uh, yeah, but I yeah. still try to stay sharp. Like I, I'll attend HeroConf. Uh, I'll pay any attention I can to what's going on in paid search. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, I'm just not going to be the one implementing it for you. <laughs> That's cool. I, I, I like that. I mean, I, I well, one, I always recommend that people – decide what they're not going to do, you know, at some point, because you can't be great at everything. And so, you know, go towards the things that, that you think you can be effective at and that you, that you want to see yourself doing. But I, I don't know enough about LinkedIn ads, to be honest, that I'm going to have to give you, you're going to have to give me a lesson as to the fundamental differences between AdWords and LinkedIn, because I think it's easy to just lump it in as PPC. Now I know that there's tremendous differences between the platforms, but could you summarize it for for me and the audience as to like the the difference between keyword based ads on AdWords and then what you do on LinkedIn? Yeah, sure. So we can pretty much equate uh, all of the social platforms because when you talk about search, you're bidding on keywords, and when you're talking about social, you're bidding on segments of the population. If it's in B two B, you're you're bidding on their attributes professionally. If it's B two C, it's their ability to to buy. It's their interest for what you do. And otherwise, the principles are still the same. You're still writing ads. The bidding algorithm still works the same way, and uh, it's just a bit different way of targeting the audience. Mm -hmm. So if you asked me like, hey, what would you rather do, search or social? Um, Unequivocally, I'm going to tell you, you got to do both. Like these are people at different uh, stages of the buying cycle and and they're different people altogether. One is going to give you this ability. I'll I'll tell you a quick story. I sent a whole ton of AdWords leads to a sales team Mm -hmm. and um, they came back to me with feedback and they said, you know, two things. Number one, thank you. These leads are so hot. And then they followed it up with a but as they always do. But do you have any way to qualify these folks? Because we're talking to the CEO and we're talking to the proverbial janitors and we're talking to everyone in between. Is there a way for us to only talk to, let's say VP and above or directors? And and I said, well, absolutely. That answer is social. Like that's, uh, you lose that intent that you get on search of someone actively looking for something that generates these really short buying cycles, Mm -hmm. people who are really late in the buying process. But what you get are the people who can afford to to buy what you have, uh, which is fantastic leads. Yeah, that's that. I agree with that. I mean, that's really interesting to think that there's so much of a difference in the intent. And I I agree with AdWords. I've run, you know, I've generated over a million leads with AdWords, and I I get the same feedback too. And that is, some companies want everything. They want to just take everything in and then use their own sales process to weed people out or to get them into the into their funnel. But the majority of people, they want hot buttered leads delivered to them, right? They want it, you know, on the table, these, these leads are the right ones. These are the best leads. And so if you don't have, and and a lot of companies know that they need something like a CRM or a qualifying program or a a phone center or something, but most companies can't make that investment. You know, it's not, not an easy investment to make. And so they'll often turn down the throttle or they'll say, like, can, can we get more targeted because our salespeople are overwhelmed with the junk. We just want the right stuff, right? We want the, the, the good stuff coming through. And, and, and in an absence of having a system to tell us what the good stuff is, we need to find other ways to do this. It just doesn't work for us how it is. Oh, yeah. And social is absolutely brilliant at that. Now, one big difference between search and social with search, someone is actively looking for a solution. So you can drop them right onto a sales page, essentially. Like, here, talk to our sales rep, take a demo, download the software, whatever. Uh, On social, on the other hand, people are not surfing around with their credit cards out. Nothing is scarier, I think, to a a casual social user than saying, 
hey, let's go right from your your anonymous activity now to talking on the phone and getting a sales pitch. Um, yeah, so yeah. They, they avoid it like crazy. So that's why in social, what we do is we start a conversation. We give mm-hmm. them something of value, a, a lead magnet, a tripwire, a, a, you know, some sort of content asset yep. for free in exchange for their email address. We start the conversation and then... Uh, that's the big difference, I think, between search and social is you have to train the sales team, you know, five seconds after someone downloads a white paper, don't They're call them. And, <laughs> yeah, don't call them and ask them, like, if they had any questions. They haven't read the thing yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it seems like it's a completely different approach. And I, and I think that, you know, I, I see more and more people realizing that and, and getting that in place where they'll have a you know, like a, basically a white paper or something to download. How do you, how do you prepare for that? I mean, what's the flow? Is it, is it on, you know, when a LinkedIn ad goes, does it go to your website? Do you create a dedicated landing page? Does video, do you put videos on there? Is it just a download? Does it go into CRM? Like what are the parameters that somebody needs to have in place in order to be successful with LinkedIn? Cause I think yeah. that one of the reasons why AdWords is so popular is that you can have somebody in the buying cycle do a search, find you, and they'll submit their information because they are ready to buy or they're they're further along versus you need to have more back-end systems in place and processes, I'd assume, to be successful on LinkedIn. You're right. So first of all, we do a lot of white papers and checklists and guides and eBooks and you know those types of assets. And the statistics that I've heard, I can't quote an exact statistic, but I think it was somewhere around 70% of white papers downloaded never get read. And so- mm-hmm. What I very first tell a client when they say, okay, we know our audience is on LinkedIn, uh, how do we prepare to advertise? The first thing I'll say is, okay, what's the biggest pain that your customer is feeling right now? What's the biggest hot topic that they want to learn about? Give them something newsworthy that they're willing to interact with and then see what kind of content that produces. If that's a, if that's a, uh, like a checklist of some kind, if it's shorter, then great, do a checklist. If it's longer, then sure, an ebook. But I think what that statistic tells me is your title means more than anything. Like you have an interesting title and it doesn't matter what type of content it is. People are going to be interested in it enough to follow through. Okay. And then you're going to need a landing page, obviously. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get a good piece of content. Usually I like to start with two in case one isn't entirely interesting and doesn't get great engagement Yep. and have a landing page that's, that's ready to, uh, ready to kick out that um, that paper. Now, one thing I will mention here is that when you're on social media, the vast majority of your traffic is going to come from mobile. So if you have an automatic download of a PDF, a lot of people are just going to ignore it and it's going to go into nice. the downloads folder. So mm-hmm. go ahead and offer the ability to download it immediately, but also send an email to their email address that says, mm-hmm. hey, when you get to your desktop, check this out. Yeah, yeah. So context specific and, and also helping them along the way, because you're right. If you download on your mobile, you're never going to read a white paper. No way. That's exactly right. So curious that then it seems like LinkedIn is most effective if there's a, a big sea of people who potentially would need your solution. There's enough people with job titles that, that fit the area. And then you can just sort of make it a numbers game where you say that there's you know, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like an industry where there's 10,000 people who are CMOs would be, who are potentially going to view this white paper, it'd be better than, than say, 100 people who, who are in that area. Is, is there a certain amount of uh, people with these job titles to make it effective? Or or how, what's like the response rate on these things? I mean, I, I've, I've seen LinkedIn ads and I've never clicked on one myself ever. So are CMOs actually clicking on these or do you just have to do a volume play? Yeah, what's really interesting is I think a lot of people will tell me, okay, we want to go after CEOs, but we don't actually believe that they engage with ads. Yeah. And I'll go, okay, well, let's let's launch and see. And of course, you're only paying when someone clicks, so very, very low risk if no one is there. But mm-hmm. I will tell you, I've, I've run multi-million dollar campaigns targeting CEOs, and they are clicking. They are engaging with ads. I'm in the same boat. I, I don't think I've, I, I've ever, like, as an interested party, ever clicked on uh, either an AdWords ad or... Um, 
or LinkedIn. I, I as an advertising professional, yeah, I yeah. try to save people the, the cash. But I think um, that means something about us, right? It means that we're that we're not in the target market. I guess that we're sort of treated as as losers, and nobody wants us on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I do like to think that uh, that when you're on LinkedIn. You want to have an audience size of between 20,000 and 50,000. Okay. If you listen to any other advice that the network gives you, they will tell you that you should have an audience size of at least 300,000. But I feel like if you have 300,000 people in a bucket, it's really hard to understand who these people are. Like at that point, you have so many people there. Uh, when I advertise on Facebook ads, uh, I'm, I'm okay with those larger audience sizes. But uh, on LinkedIn, if I end up with a, a, an audience size of 200,000, I know I can separate those guys somehow and then compare those two audiences and mm-hmm. learn something about them. If it's, yeah, yeah. if it's VP and above, cool. We'll take one campaign that targets only VPs and one that targets only the C- C-level folks and I then see. compare the two and see, does your yeah. content resonate better with the C-suite or does it resonate better with a little bit lower. Yeah, yeah. So I so a lot of testing within into what you're doing. Do you sorry, first of all, I'm distracted because I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now and above your head, and I'll have to put this in the show notes, it says there's an ad that says professional men, our leading matchmaking network needs successful men aged thirty five to sixty. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I don't really know what that means. So well I, I might even go down that wormhole and see their whole funnel and put it into our show notes because it's sort of sort of funny but that i mean i i was just trying to remember where linkedin ads even exist right because it's um (laughs) yeah so it's sort of funny that that's how this all this all works is that there are targets you know i'm i'm a man 35 to 60 i'm 35 and so that that must be what put me in there and it knows that i'm a professional so that maybe they're they're their uh, targeting settings. But I think that's sort of a good segue into how you do this as well. And that is you target based on several different areas. Do you test, do you test ad copy like you would in AdWords? Do you, how many variables are you testing at a time? Yeah. So I think it's really similar to that of AdWords, actually. Um, I mean, you're testing ad copy, you're testing landing pages, you're, you're testing imagery. Um, so I guess that's an extra thing that you get with social is imagery is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, what uh, the extra variable that you have in there, though, is is time. So usually with uh, with something in search with AdWords, you can launch the same ad copy and it's not going to saturate. It's like people aren't searching the same keywords all the time. And so you're going to get new prospects all the time. Uh, rarely have to update your ads. I mean, obviously, you should be testing. But uh, but with social, what happens is, you know, uh, after a week on Twitter ads, your ads are going to decay. Everyone's already seen it. Everyone who's, mm-hmm. who's going to click already has. And so you have to re, like refresh it all. On Facebook, it's usually like a week to two weeks. On LinkedIn, I usually have about 28 days, I found. Mm. Usually between 28 and 33 days. Because uh, content, people don't log in quite nearly as often. Yep. Um, and so, but that means not only do I have to take a look at which ad copy is performing, but I'm also paying attention to how long it's been out there and mm-hmm. how long before I have to change it. Not because it wasn't good and didn't perform, but because it looks stale. Yeah, interesting. I didn't. I, yeah, so it, it, that's a huge window of opportunity. But I think that makes sense because. I don't look at these ads all the time. And if I do notice them, it might be, at, like you said, once a month. So you don't have as much frequency problems. Whereas Facebook, man, frequency, they need some frequency capping <laughs> that to put, to put in place. Because I see the same ads over and over again. And and actually, I was just looking at Facebook's targeting settings. And I, and, and, and I was like, why isn't there frequency capping? And they say, because studies show that you need to see it three times to want to wanna click on it or something like that. And so they, <laughs> they actually purposely do that they they look at that as a feature not a not a bug on the, on the system uh, survey says that our yeah. our uh, our constituents our stockholders mm. yes. want us to make more money <laughs> yes our stockholders they've resoundingly said <laughs> that when you make us more money we're happy <laughs> and so <laughs> we're gonna make our stock our shareholders happy not you jeff so <laughs> that's funny okay so so is does this work? Have you ever been in a situation where this didn't work well, or, or is it a certain company that can do this? Is it is it always B two B? Is it always um, large companies selling like software as a service? Is there types of industries where this works better? 
Yeah, there's such an important point here to be made. Uh, if you've compared, let's say, Facebook or Twitter ads to LinkedIn ads, you'll see one big difference, and that's the cost per click. Mm-hmm. On LinkedIn, most of my clients are paying between 6 and $8 per click. Every time someone clicks, you're paying 6 to 8 bucks, And that's a pretty high-value click. Uh, there are some folks in search who are like, no, I'm paying fourteen twenty a click, and yeah, that's yeah. Not, not a big deal. But that's a big deal, I think, for most people, especially when you're talking higher in the funnel. On Facebook ads, I'm usually paying between eighty cents and a buck fifty. Yeah. Um, so orders of magnitude different. But the big difference is when someone is on LinkedIn, they're either thinking about their work or their career. Mm-hmm. And so you're showing them ads that have to do with that, like enhancing either their current work, the current problems they're facing, or their future career. Um, so that's going to be things like, and I have found that it's exclusively B2B because most B2C advertisers aren't willing to pay six to eight bucks. Yeah, a yeah. Uh, I've also found that because of the higher cost per click, you really do need to, to start with a product or a service where you're making at least 15K out of the deal. Okay, you know, okay. If you're making that's less it. than, yeah, lower than that lifetime value or deal size, like LinkedIn's probably not your platform just because the unit economics aren't going to work. Yeah, for sure. That's actually was going to be my next question is like, what, what deal size do you need? What, um, what conversion rates do you experience? And then, you know, obviously a, a well-run, well-oiled B2B machine knows that, Hey, our average deal size is 15 K or 150 K, whatever that ends up being. And that we need, you know, this many leads in the pipeline and we're willing to pay this much in order to, to get to that point is our LinkedIn conversion rates because somebody clicking is targeted in a business safe environment Do that, does that increase conversion rate? Or are you still getting the, well, I know that the old metric is that the average website has a 2% conversion rate. Is it more like 10? Is it, is it in a reasonable or is it, does it run the gamut and you can't really pin it down? Yeah. So I've, I've usually, well, I've run like five or six tests of trying to mimic exactly the same targeting between Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, just, just to see. And usually I get about twice the conversion rate on LinkedIn than I do on Facebook. And okay. I, I consider, like I reason through the fact that it's probably because on Facebook you have a lot of bot clicks and like invalid traffic. Um, you have a lot of tire kickers and, you know, accidental clicks on LinkedIn. Yep. You don't see that a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have that context of I am on LinkedIn, so I'm thinking about my work or my career, and I'm being offered something that has to do with my work or my career. I'm not on my way to playing Farmville again and you know getting derailed. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so so when you're doing these ads, yeah, tell me about the what the ad units look like, what options you have, and then how do you target somebody in them? Yeah, so there was an ad unit that came out in 2008, and it's we call them the text ads, and they're the right rail ads that very closely resemble that of search, it, with one big difference is they have a little 50 by 50 pixel image. Most people that I introduce these ad units to go, oh, that's interesting, I've never seen those, and yet they've been around since 2008. Uh, mm-hmm. We're all banner blind to them, they feel like ads, they look like ads, uh, and no one interacts with them, and that is quite evident from their, their click-through rates. When you get a 0.03% click-through rate on those ads, you're doing great. (laughs) Uh, They're just, I mean, that's, to put it in perspective, that's three people out of every 10,000 who view it are going to interact with that ad. And so you need really, like, big audiences to make those work. But the cool part is those only show up on desktop. So if you have a a mobile experience that struggles, then that's probably going to be the ad unit for you. Mm -hmm. Um, the next ad unit came out in 2013, and it very closely resembles that of Facebook's promoted post, and they're called Sponsored Content. They ap- mm-hmm. uh, appear right in your feed, and, uh, and uh, I mean, as with social, you're going to have like 65 to 75% of your traffic coming from there is going to come from a mobile device. So make sure mm-hmm. that your mobile experience just rocks. Um, you get nice big images there, um, and it's, it's a very good unit to tell a content story and mm-hmm. to to link to content, whereas the right rail text ads don't work all that great for sharing content. And then the final one actually just came out here about probably six months ago to the self-service platform that you and I can go on and use right now. And they're called sponsored in mail. And these are really interesting as opposed to the previous two, you don't pay per click, you pay per recipient. And so you need to make sure like your goal as a marketer is to make this feel as intensely personal as possible when it's not, it's a mass mail. 
so you can do things like like insert their first name, insert their last name. Mm. But this has to feel like a personal invitation. Otherwise, it's going to be insanely expensive. Yeah, so you write something like, dear sir or madam. <laughs> exactly. That's the fastest way to just get that thing ignored. <laughs> yeah. And then I think, and then I think something really awesome about this is that there's a really strict frequency cap. If someone okay. hits you with a, a sponsored in mail, that's the only one you're going to see for a full two months. Oh, interesting. I've because I have gotten those, and I I think that LinkedIn for me has become an an area where people are constantly reaching out to me using these strategies, sometimes paid and sometimes not paid. But it seems like the mail system in LinkedIn has been become sort of abused or or frustrating for a lot of people and so have those units worked out well or is it is that that lack of frequency or every two months is that is that helping them out or how does that work yeah i think it helps quite a bit i actually used these ad units when they were three dollars per recipient and Mm -hmm. you know spent lots of thousands of dollars on a very very much failed campaign okay Um, and LinkedIn has made several changes since then. First of all, they lowered the price. You're now probably going to pay anywhere between about 50 cents and a dollar per cent. And, uh, and that's also going to only show up when someone is logged into LinkedIn. And so okay. they're going to see the flag turn on. They're going to see it while they're surfing. Oh, yeah. So they're, so they're not getting an email notification about it. It's just coming into their message center. Exactly. And an email notification doesn't come because LinkedIn values the privacy of their members yeah. so much. Okay. And so you've got to be there to see it. And if you want it to, I mean, if it's worth, you know, 65 cents to send one of these things out, like you, you got to hope someone sees that it's there. Yeah, for sure. And so how, how does this work, the competition? Or I'd, I'd assume that, that if you're not selling a $15,000 deal, you're going to be using some of the the LinkedIn savvy ways of reaching out to people that, that maybe are advocated on blogs, like an org, like organic LinkedIn. Yeah. What I'm in. And so for example, I, this happens to me all the time and it's so annoying, but it's like, look at my profile, connect with me. And then the second I accept it and I know these people are going to pitch me. I know it's so, <laughs> I know it's so hard that they're going to do that. Like, that's exactly what they're going to do. But I reluctantly accept because they might have some new mutual connections or whatever. And immediately they send me an email saying, Hey, Hey, person, they don't even personalize it. They just say, hey, you, I noticed that you're somebody, you know, the flatter, flatter, flatter. And then just like, you need to, you know, we're selling something or we want you to do something that it's like all like assume that I'm going to click through and read about their service. How does that, you know, I know that's, that's like the poor person's way of doing LinkedIn advertising. Does that conflict with what you're doing in ads? Is it, can, can one plus one equal three? How, what's the difference between that strategy I just outlined or that I see people using and then what you're doing? Yeah, first of all, the strategy that people are using on you when you see that, the reason that you're having some like cognitive and emotional dissonance here is because that's just really bad marketing. That's just like, <laughs> that's asking for marriage on the first date. It's, yes. it's creepy. Um, and so when done properly, organic lead generation on LinkedIn is extremely powerful. And it's something I do recommend. Uh, when I go into a client, I might say, hey, I'm going to be doing this for your your marketing team, but your sales team might want to bring someone in who specializes on organic lead generation, uh, mm-hmm. reaching out to the right people, starting conversations, uh, having having a real conversation before you even try to pitch your product. And this is something it's... Um, Usually what happens is I'm showing ads that have a lot of impressions and people will look at that and go like, okay, I'm not interested in interacting with this company. But then someone from the sales team or someone from the company will reach out to them and and they go, oh, this is a legit company. I should talk to them. I should respond because I've seen their ads before. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about. Is Is there a lift in doing both activities? I can only assume that familiarity helps out in most cases, especially if you're not being pushy or if you're not trying to seal the deal on the first date. Oh, exactly. Yeah, they, they all do blend together. And obviously, one of those services I get paid for doing and one I don't. <laughs> so I'm yep. going to I'm gonna more closely advocate for the one that I get compensated for. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I do recommend it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, that well, and, and I think it's just like Facebook. If you run Facebook ads, you notice that, you know, sometimes people will like your page or you get more engagement, even if, you know, in a paid ad, it doesn't always result in the action you want but it's but being out there is good and then also the more organic activity you do the more people are going to engage with your paid ads and so it's like you just i i've I've been saying this a lot and that is that marketing it's all about doing a lot of marketing for a long period of time right that's that's the key to all this thing is to do a lot of things for a long period of time that's the only way you can really build a brand and to continue to thrive in this area 
And so and if, I, if it means doing an organic outreach strategy plus doing ads to cement it, you can. it's usually going to work better than doing nothing. I remember <laughs> reading all these AdWords studies where, you know, the number one question I got when I was doing PPC was, why would I bid on paid search when I'm already number one on organic? Why would I pay for something that I'm getting for free? And then, you know, I say, well, you're going to get an 87% higher chance of getting clicked on at all because most people will only click on, you know, 50% of the time at most. So you can now get more coverage, for example. That's right. And I think the strongest force for conversion, the, the biggest effect on whether or not someone converts is the concept of social proof. And so when you have social proof, either because uh, you've seen that people have liked or commented or shared something from a company or whether you see, you've just seen the company around and that's a little bit of familiarity, I think that's going to lead to much higher conversion. Cool. I mean, yeah, I think so too. So this is a fascinating dive into LinkedIn ads. It's, I've learned more on this than I have in the last 10 years of using LinkedIn. So hopefully uh, everybody else that's listening finds it useful as well. Um, I want to, I don't want to, I, I mean, I, we could just talk LinkedIn ads the whole time, but I, I sort of want to get into your journey into entrepreneurship. And that is, you know, you had said agency and then you went in-house and then you said, I'm never going to do an agency again. And then you started an agency. <laughs> um, what, what's going through your head at that time? How do you decide to start an agency? Yeah, so I actually had a really fun story here. I've always considered myself very entrepreneurial, but I'm also quite conservative. I, I married a very conservative wife. And so we always have you know a ton of savings, like we're big savers, very financially conservative. And so every time I thought about, hey, you know, what if I went out on my own? What if I started my own company? And the answer was always, no, going without a paycheck sounds really scary. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm here at this technology company. I'm killing it with LinkedIn ads. I'm, I'm uh, probably the most educated on the platform in the entire world. And I'm looking around going, holy cow, no one is out there talking about this. Like when I have a problem and I Google search it, there's no results. Uh, maybe that should be me. Like maybe mm -hmm. I should be that voice. And so I'd come home and I'd talk to my wife about it. And she, she'd say, I, I remember her one time saying, Actually, of all the ideas that you've brought forward, I think this one makes the most sense. I think this has legs. And I got really excited. Uh, some changes ended up happening at that company, and I, I started to be uh, much less happy with, with my mm. role. Uh, a yep. new boss came in. And, um, and so I started kind of reading a little bit of the writing on the wall. Uh, I wasn't happy. My guess is the company wasn't happy with me. And then after about six months of that, um, my boss walked me into the HR office, and I was being let go. And what? Obviously, like I've got three kids, one on the way, like I am crushed as a, as a, an ego, a breadwinner, but, um, I, I went home and went, okay, like I have an, an option here. Like maybe this is the kick I need. And, uh, and so we did like, of course, talking to the wife, we, we talked about different opportunities. I went and got four job offers just to make sure, um, mm -hmm. we're religious mm -hmm. people. We prayed about the decision and felt guided that no, don't accept any of those opportunities, uh, go off and start B2 linked. And so that's what we did. Um, it, I'm an unlikely entrepreneur because I didn't have the guts and it was incredibly scary for the first five months, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I would never, ever regret that decision. It's been amazing since. That's crazy. Like to think, and, and, and just so that everybody knows saying that you're one of the, that you know more about LinkedIn ads than anybody in the world is true. I mean, I, I think you do. I mean, that's, that's not even like a, that that's just a almost a fact at this point because you were early an early adopter in the platform. You've been managing campaigns and everything, and there's still not many people who have risen to be the the LinkedIn people. So I've always thought of you as a LinkedIn guy, and and that's sort of where we became friends. I was like, this guy loves LinkedIn as much as I love Google Analytics, for example, or as much as I love these things. And so, it's sort of cool to see that you know that you can create a business off of it too, because just knowing something versus being able to turn it into a business are two different things. And I think you, you realize that early on. And so it, obviously they had to force your hand, which is unfortunate that that happened. But now that you're, you know, into it for, for several years, it seems like it was the right move. Oh yeah. And it was definitely the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my life. Even though a situation like that, no one likes to be unemployed. No one likes to be told that as a person and as a, a professional, you're worthless. Mm -hmm. um, th that's the feeling you get when you get let go, let go. Oh, yeah. you know? So, um, but yeah, I, I would absolutely recommend if you have a skill that you realize that you are the best at in the entire world, you can definitely monetize that. Like don't hang on any longer. 
go and, and find a way to monetize that. And in my case, it was a skill. It was like a, an ad platform. So I was either going to go find one company that that needed LinkedIn ads super bad, uh, mm-hmm. but there just aren't that many companies out there who are wholly reliant on it. Yeah, or I'm yeah. going to do the agency model or consultant model of I'm going to use this knowledge to help as many advertisers as possible. Yeah, for sure. So, so you said the first five months were sort of light. Um, did you did you have any clients to start out with, or were you sort of just doing business development? How does how does it work? Where you you know I I advocate that when people start their own agency or freelancing that they have an anchor client. So you and, and a lot of people we've talked to on the podcast, some of your some of your friends from Salt Lake City, a lot of them started by taking their current job and using like you know having them pay them for the same work they did but work half as much and then they go out and find the rest of their clients and then the agency is born whereas you don't you almost you know i and and obviously i can't i I wouldn't advocate getting let let go but you can't i mean what can you do about that but but obviously i tell people like take a client with you but this is an option for you so how do you how do you cope yeah, so that was the scariest part, I think. I mean, when you get let go, obviously, you're not going to make the offer of, hey, I'd like to still work for you guys. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> uh, so I did not have a Halo client. And in fact, before I, I got let go, I was uh, feeling dissatisfied and started looking out like, maybe I could do something here. And so I started letting everyone know, hey, I'm doing some LinkedIn ads consulting. And mm-hmm. And I had no bites, like there was no one interested. And it wasn't until I was gone completely from my gig and you know, put out that shingle, planted my flag before people started taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. And then I got leads like crazy. Uh, And, you know, in the first month, I think I had two gigs on Upwork just doing hourly, help me set up my LinkedIn campaigns. Okay. By by month two, I'd had lunch with a whole bunch of my uh, my local friends, just letting them know what I was doing. And they made intros to their friends and had a few small clients. And by month five, uh, I had surpassed my, my previous income at this technology company. Wow. That's wow. So that, that's that's so fascinating to me because I think that it, it. Well, frankly, I mean, some people can do it in month one. They can replace their income because of the anchor client or the, as you said, a halo client. I like that one too. But I think usually, if you don't have that in place, people will struggle a lot longer than five months to get to that point. So it's either you start out with that in the bag, or you you, you spend years to to replace that that area. So it's. Do you think that that has to do? I mean, you're such a, you're so niche. I mean, you've been doing this for three years and there's not like a, I, I couldn't personally name a number two in the LinkedIn ad space. And it's like, it's AJ. And so <laughs> is that, is that part of how it, how it's going? Is it that it's so specialized or is it just, um, the amount of business development you did? Is it, is it an easy sell once you find the, the group of people who need you? Is it because, the, because there's only a finite list of people who can utilize your skills? You know, I think it was a, a large amount of luck just simply because I am so specialized. And so when I introduced the concept of LinkedIn advertising, most are exactly like I was five years ago and go, oh, I, I've never even heard of it. I don't mm-hmm. I don't know about that. But the nice part about the sale is everyone knows and trusts and usually likes LinkedIn. They at mm-hmm. least have a, a profile and they've used it and they appreciate the fact of what they get for free. And so yep. – you introduce the concept of, okay, this platform that you already know, like, and trust has an ad platform. Let me help you with that. I'm the best yeah. in the world at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't say best in the world to brag. I'm just literally the only one. I've, I've spent more <laughs> money than anyone else on the planet. So I'm, as a person, I'm pretty dumb. But as an advertiser, I'm, I'm pretty advanced for what's out there. So if yeah, any yeah. potential competitors are listening, come step up. Take all my business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> best in the world by default, huh? No, no, that, I mean, it, I, I think that it's – I mean, I, I have no – like it's it, it is what it is. You are the best in the world at what you do, and it's it's really cool to see that see that take place and to see it, to see it thrive as well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna try to stay in that position as long as possible because you're right. I mean, it's like if I were to go out right now and start an AdWords agency or an SEO or a Facebook ads agency, it would take me a lot longer than five months to recoup. So I was really lucky on that front. No, it's it's fascinating to be in such a specific area and to be be able to thrive and then once you do that you can build a moat around your business too by being you know successful and and helping people there and what you had said earlier about linkedin and the trust i I do agree you know i think some people are annoyed by linkedin with all the notifications and stuff like that but at the same time the trust is there i mean if people are on there and these are real people real you know real business people it's it's there's absolutely trust in that network and i and i know that i've been in conversations where 
in a B2B situation where they say, well, where is everybody hanging out, right? Like, so salespeople will say, well, I, I just want to know where everybody is that that is doing this or that needs our product. And LinkedIn's the answer, right? Like, it's the answer to your question about where are people hanging out that, that are this job title and these types of companies is LinkedIn. There's really no number two there either. I mean, it's basically LinkedIn or trying to go to some kind of weird niche industry forum or, or go to a trade show or something. That's right. I mean, every network you're going to find spam on, every single network. But LinkedIn is, I think, the most trustworthy of all of them because we, we've seen the least amount or uh, probably what I would say the least egregious types of spam. Yep. And and you're right. I mean, because the targeting on LinkedIn is so incredible for B2B, um, even if you're, you're – prospect is, is hanging out somewhere else, uh, this is the only place that you can reach them, like reliably reach them. You can set a campaign that says, I only want to target digital marketers in, uh, let, let's let say, high tech companies with over 500 employees in the US. Like you can get that specific and you're going to wade through a lot of trash on any other network trying to reach just that person. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, it's fascinating to think that too. And I mean that's really interesting how this all comes together, and that is that there are it's it's so specific both the skills you have in advertising plus what people need, and it's such a specialized area, and that there's only certain size companies that need this, and there's there's all these parameters that need to happen that that it's sort of the perfect storm for you to to be riding that wave, and so it's cool, and it'll be interesting to see how how things develop in in LinkedIn if more. If if the pricing keeps it so that it's only people who have at least fifteen thousand dollar deal size, and that naturally prices out the majority of advertisers, or or where things go, and and I think you had mentioned that there's the free stuff that LinkedIn gives you, and then there's the the paid platform. So how do those things balance as well? Like what? How do you balance the fact that there's this great business network that's available to you for free, <laughs> and then also that there's the ability to advertise on it too. And I can tell you, um, so we just became official LinkedIn partners last month. So I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, we're the first service providers to do that. But at the, but because of that, I, I'm under NDA and can't talk about a lot of things that I, I, I know about the roadmap. Yeah. But um, there are some things that have become public uh, through other means. So I feel like I'm, I'm okay to talk about them. There are a couple developments that I'm really, really excited about that are going to take the platform from being a 15K deal size only uh, down to too much less. Um, okay. Have you ever heard of the, the term account-based marketing? Yeah. Yeah. So you, yep, exactly. Yeah. So um, you have been able to do account-based marketing, which is essentially targeting only specific companies for uh, for quite a while. I mean, you can target by company name and and add filters on top of that. But um, LinkedIn recently released the ability for us to upload a list of up to 36,000 companies. And so what I've found a lot of success in doing is you, uh, if you just send leads to the sales team, they're not bought in and you might not find them dialing your leads uh, all the time uh, or giving them enough credence and it could make your channel look bad. Uh, but if you go to the sales team and you say, hey, each sales guy, give me a list of the top 50 logos that you would kill to work with. Mm -hmm. and one of them might be really into boats, and so they're going to say, "Oh, I'm going to. I, I want to work with all the boat manufacturers because that's my passion." Yep. And then what happens is you go create an ABM campaign and target only those companies, and that way the leads that come in are extremely highly valuable, and those sales reps are so excited to work them, and you end up with just extremely, extremely efficient campaigns. Um, oh yeah, so for sure. Some exciting stuff on the roadmap coming down that uh, I think lowers the barrier quite a bit. Awesome. Well, that's that's really exciting, and I I think there's a few people who are going to listen to this and get excited about LinkedIn ads. I know I'm I'm trying to think about how I can use it for myself because I, I like uh, untapped markets like, like what blue ocean versus red ocean that type of stuff. But uh, I think that there's there's a lot of opportunities here, and so um, I mean there's a lot of things that I still want to ask, but we're getting towards the end of our time, so we'll have to you know do a follow up at some point in time. Uh, but the last question I want to ask is. Anybody who's looking to get into this online marketing world or, or even LinkedIn ads, where, where should they start? Is there any resources you can provide them, anything that you've done, your company website, any other thought leaders that they should follow? Yeah, I, I've, um, 
I write kind of slowly, but I've written a lot of content and done podcasts and webinars and, and that kind of thing. So if you have a specific question about LinkedIn, uh, do a search and I'm probably going to show up somewhere. <laughs> if it's something you want to learn in a systematic way, if you go to my website, b2linked.com, and this is something we talked about when we were hanging out in Salt Lake uh, a few months back, but I'm going to be coming out with courses here pretty soon. And so if you sign up on the courses uh, notification page, the first course for anyone who's already signed up by the time I launch will be free. And, uh, and so come and like learn the first bit with me holding your hand. And then after that, um, you know, it, you should have a good leg up. Awesome. So that I, I'm excited for that too. I think that that's a, a great opportunity to, to learn from the expert. If you want to learn from the foremost expert in the world in LinkedIn ads, then, then that's going to be the place to be. And so we'll, <laughs> we'll put some, some links in our show notes and, and keep people up to date with, with your developments on there too. And I'll also say that if you fill out the form on the website, you're not going to be put into a sales funnel. Uh, you're not going to be talking to a sales guy. Uh, I'm the one who answers those. So if you have a LinkedIn question, hit me on Twitter or fill out the form. Like I'm not a high a high pressure sales pitch person. In fact, I might try to talk you out of it. Um, so yeah, just hit me up, ask questions, and and if you're looking for resources, I'm more than happy to to point you towards things that I've written or or done that could help you along the way. I love that as a sales strategy. Tell people, like, try not to sell people and tell them that they shouldn't be doing this and then they want it more. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And it's it's not the intended um, purpose behind it. Uh, but I, I really will tell people more often than not, like, hey, LinkedIn's probably not your best network. You should yeah. probably start on Facebook ads for, for what you're doing. Um, but you're right. As a sales strategy, like a lot of times being told this is not for you, people immediately go, well, wait, how can we make this work? <laughs> Exactly. That's great. I mean, I, I love what you've been able to do and what you've been able to accomplish. And I, and I also appreciate that you're letting everybody on, on this podcast know if they have questions, they can reach out to you. So that's really cool. And uh, like I said, in our show notes, we'll, we'll put some of your contact info and your website and everything so people can get that nice and handy. And uh, any closing thoughts you want to share with everybody? I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship. I feel like if, if you feel deep down inside that you are an entrepreneur and maybe you're in the same boat as me uh, and you go, I, I don't know if I have the guts, um, don't be afraid to go work in corporate, go work for the man, work for someone else, learn on their dime. And then as soon as you do feel like you have uh, a niche, something that you know more about than anyone else in the world, then go off and monetize it. And, uh, and, and you know, I'll be standing behind you the whole way. That's awesome. AJ, thanks so much for joining us. This has been really, really awesome. That's right. Wow, what a valuable conversation. Now, I don't know about you, but he answered all of the questions that I had about LinkedIn, both as an advertising platform, just overall how LinkedIn works, and then some. He told us things like the target market for a company that should be using LinkedIn ads, and that's if you have a sale of $15,000 or higher. He even gave us a preview of what might come in the not-so-distant future, some opportunities for us all to use LinkedIn ads in a very specific way. AJ is the embodiment of the term niche down when it comes to your business. He's focused on one thing, he's passionate about that platform, and he's leveraged his unique vantage point into a nice business. And the best part was that he shared his story about getting let go from his job and how that helped inspire him to take the leap, and he even gives encouraging words to entrepreneurs who are looking to take the leaps themselves. So I hope that if you ever find yourself in the position that AJ found himself in, you can learn from his overall positive experience. Thanks for the chat, AJ. Looking forward to having you out at an MN Search event in the future. For show notes, visit jefflytics.com slash AJ.